in today's talk, I'm going to draw on those 30 years of experience and specifically my uh, research on UK relationship with the EU. Um, by looking at five aspects of the UK's uh, consequences of the Brexit referendum. I should say it's too early to tell in many respects what the long-term consequences of Brexit are. Um, the effects of the referendum and the negotiations will last the rest of my lifetime and possibly even yours. I'm going to talk in five parts about the political system of the EU, the, uh, in particular how the Parliament, and this is a picture of the Palace of Westminster where the House of Commons and the House of Lords sits, you'll all be familiar with it, how that has changed through the Brexit referendum. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about what are some of the consequences of the referendum. Um, uh, and what are these, some of the potential opportunities of Britain leaving the EU? Thirdly, I'm going to talk about Scottish independence, but you cannot talk about Scottish independence without talking about the relationship between the four home countries or nations of the UK, that is England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Fourthly, I'll talk about the relationship between the UK and the USA, as you know, um, in November, that's roughly in a month's time, there'll be a presidential election in the US. We won't know the outcome immediately, un unlike the previous uh, hundreds of years of US uh, history, because there will be many postal uh, votes. Uh, but on the 3rd of, of November, we will start to know what this means a little bit more for the UK. And then finally, I'm going to talk about a post-Brexit EU. What, what does the future hold for the, the UK? At the end of each of these sections, I'll stop and take a look at the chat. Um, to see uh, if you have any questions for me. Okay, let's proceed then. I can't cover every aspect of the UK's relationship uh, and the effects of the post-Brexit referendum, um, but I'm going to focus on uh, what I think to be three of the most interesting aspects of the political system of the United Kingdom. That is its electoral system, uh, the use of referenda in the UK and the question of equality and inequality in the UK. The UK is what I would describe as a proto-democracy. It's, it's very popular to describe it as the, the mother of all parliaments because it gave birth to many other democracies around the world. Um, but in my mind, it's a proto-democracy. It is an early modern democracy, which is not um, managed to modernize in the way that it needs to, to become a genuine democracy. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, the British electoral system is based on what's known as first past the post or plurality electoral system. That is that the person that gets the most votes in each constituency, that is like a commune area, um, is elected the winner, even if that person doesn't get more than 50% of the votes. Um, and so what this in effect does is produce majorities in the House of Commons, um, but they don't often, in fact, since 1935, they've never been a majority of the people that vote, vote for that government. Uh, this is often called a two-party system because it tends to give rise to only two parties capable of holding power. In this century, that has been the Conservative Party, here marked in blue, and the Labour Party. But there are other parties, so it is not a two-party system. In fact, there are currently ten parties represented in the House of Commons. Since 1935, Every British government has been, in effect, a minority government because it has never had a majority of the electorate vote for it. And this is true today. Uh, Boris Johnson's government has 80 seat majority in the House of Commons, but it received uh, only above 42% of the electoral votes. Um, and interestingly, the majority of people voted for a Remain party, but that was not what was elected. Another complicating factor is that the Palace of Westminster, the House of Lords and the House of Commons 
are not the only parliament in the United Kingdom. There are currently four national assemblies, um, but one of them isn't a national uh, nation. There's the uh, Welsh Assembly, the Northern Irish Assembly in Stormont, the uh, Scottish Parliament, each of which covers those three countries, and then there's the House of Commons, which covers the whole of the United Kingdom. So it's four nations, but not four national assemblies. This means that the political system of the UK is both unrepresentative and has tensions within it. If you look at the Green Line, for instance, in the UK general elections, those are nationalist parties. Plaid Cymru, that's the, the, the Welsh National Party, and the SNP, that's the Scottish National Party. So they're represented in the British Parliament and in the Scottish and Welsh assemblies at the same time. The second thing to be said about the political system of the UK is historically it has been a representative democracy. It has had very little use of referenda or um, popular plebiscites. The intellectual hairs, if we can say that word, um, leaders of the Conservative Party in the past, that's Winston Churchill and for the Conservatives and Clement Attlee for the Labour Party, firmly did not believe in the use of referenda. In 1911, Winston Churchill made his views clear, saying that I believe in democracy acting through representative institutions, that is, parliaments. In 1945, uh, and his sweeping electoral victory after the Second World War to uh, the uh, British House of Parliament, he argued that I could not consent to the introduction into our national life of a device, that's a referenda, so alien to our traditions as the referenda, which has too often been the instrument of Nazism and fascism. And that is correct. In historically, uh, authoritarian dictators, the Nazis and fascists around the world, have used popular plebiscites or ref referenda basically to enforce their rule through a system of direct democracy. More recently, there have been, since 1973, three UK referenda. One in 1973 to remain in the European community as it was then, one then under the Conservatives in 2011 to have a alternate vote, that's a um, proportional representation system, that failed. Uh, and one in 2016 to remain or leave the EU. Um, and that passed marginally, and we'll talk about that in the next sec section of slides. There was one more important referenda that applied to Scotland only in 2014, and that was on Scottish um, independence. At the time, that failed by 55% of people wanting Scotland to remain in the United Kingdom and 45 wanting to leave the United Kingdom. Now, everything has changed since then. But what hasn't changed is there's no widespread use of referenda at a UK level, and the rules governing the use of referenda are incredibly weak indeed. Indeed, I would say there are literally no rules governing the spending, the activity, and the use of um, publicity material in referenda across the UK. The third aspect we need to think about in considering the political system of the UK is related to its status as a, a, a proto-democracy, and I would call it a proto-modern society. The UK is, possibly with the exception of Belarus, it's hard to tell, um, the most unequal country in Europe, and certainly in the European Union. The diagram that I've provided for you uh, is a Gini inequality diagram. Uh, Gini is a measure of how unequal, in this case, incomes, that salaries, payment for work, for jobs, is in three different countries. The United Kingdom in blue, Denmark in red, and the United States in yellow. A Gini score of 100 means it's perfectly unequal. A Gini score of zero means it's perfectly equal. Uh, a perfectly equal society is where everyone has the same salary, a sort of um, a hypothetical uh, communist utopia. Perfectly unequal society is where only one person owns everything, like a monarchy or let's say North Korea. What we can see from this diagram is that since the 1960s, both Denmark and the UK had 
increasingly lower levels of inequality. Uh, and Denmark in the 1980s and the 1990s had a, a, a 0.2 or a 20 Gini inequality measure. That's very, very low, one of the lowest in the, uh, in the developed world and making Denmark one of the, the most equal and perhaps successful societies in the world. The UK after the Second World War did have similar levels of inequality until the election in 1979 of Margaret Thatcher. The Conservatives systematically moved levels of inequality in the UK much, much higher, much closer to the United States. Uh, today, inequality in the UK is about 35 to 38. In the USA, it's about 40. Um, USA isn't the most unequal society in the world. Uh, countries like Russia and Brazil are. But what we can see here is that the UK is an outlier in Europe. It is closer to, let's say, the United States or Russia or Brazil than it is to other EU countries and to Denmark. Uh, four examples of what this inequality means. Firstly, in education. About 93% of pupils, that's um, students in the UK, go to state or grammar schools. Uh, I went to a state school. Um, whereas about 7% go to private, or in the UK these are known as public or independent schools. Um, very expensive, uh, very elitist schools uh, where the rulers of Britain are trained and told that they are very, very special indeed. Boris Johnson. Uh, being a leading example, as was David Cameron before him. Um, the second example is in healthcare. 92% of British people are treated in the public healthcare system, the national health, healthcare system called the NHS, the National Health Service, versus about 8% of extremely wealthy families and individuals have private medicine and private care. And one example would be the Bupa. Um, health insurance system, like the US in some respects. The third example is Parliament itself. Within the House of Commons, about 29%, about a third of all members of Parliament come from independent or private schools, the very wealthy elite of Britain. That's a very, very high proportion. Um, it's much higher in the Conservative Party, the, the party of uh, the right wing or um, uh, bourgeois and aristocracy. The, the fourth and final example is the British government itself. This is Boris Johnson's cabinet is made out of 64% of ministers from independent schools. Of those, 45% went to Oxbridge, that's Oxford and Cambridge. Oxford has provided the highest number of prime ministers since the end of the Second World War. All four of these indicators, together with the uh, data on uh, income inequality, demonstrate that the UK is an incredibly unequal country um, in terms of education, in terms of health, in terms of income, in terms of representation in Parliament, in terms of the government running the country. And this has some dramatic effects on its politics. In this next section, section two, I want to talk about, in particular, the Brexit opportunities and consequences. I'm going to start by talking about the referenda and the political consequences of the referenda. And then I will switch to more economic matters, talking about free trade, um, trade in goods, trade in services. Um, first note, top left-hand corner of the slide. Um, the EU has never been that important an issue in the United Kingdom. I know this sounds funny. Uh, people often talk about the EU as the, uh, the UK as the awkward partner or something Eurosceptical, when in fact what they mean is anti-European. These have never been broad descriptions of the UK. As you can see from this diagram, when Britons are asked which is one of the most important issues facing the country at general elections, at European Parliament elections, at, at local elections, since 2006, the EU, EU has always been of minor importance. Less than 10% of people up to the middle of 2015 have answered that the EU is important to them. So a very interesting question is how did the EU become important? One part of this story 
and you can read this if you have the chance to read uh, Peter uh, Gagan's article on dark money and dirty politics in the UK, is that a group of extremely wealthy uh, business people, in fact, businessmen, they're almost entirely male, um, were concerned about the EU's attempts to introduce controls on and to tax um, corporate activity across the EU, ranging all the way from financial transactions to uh, tech giants like social media giants, most of which pay no tax and are very lightly regulated in the EU. Many of them are based offshore, that is outside the EU. But that's one part of the story. Many of these men had invested millions of pounds into the Conservative Party. And so they used this influence to get David Cameron to call a referendum on his victory in 2015. So since 2015, as the top left-hand diagram shows you, graph shows you, the interest in the EU in the UK exploded up to 2017, when 50% of people said they were interested in the e EU. So the answer to why it became an important issue in the UK is mostly to do with the influence of extremely wealthy people, shaping in particular through right-wing news newspapers in the UK, The Sun, The Mail, The Express, The Times, The Telegraph, The Spectator, through right-wing news media in the UK, for instance, Sky TV, the British equivalent of Fox. Um, what was important for Britain? The campaign to, in the referenda was uh, led to remain by the uh, Conservative Party's David Cameron, the Prime Minister. Uh, to leave was led by Boris Johnson, the comedian, the um, uh, twice uh, sacked journalist and the former um, leader or mayor of London. The Leave campaign, known as Vote Leave, made five claims about taking back control, and I've got them in the bottom left-hand picture. The first was to take back control of our money, of our economy, the second, our borders, the third, our security, our taxes, and to vote Leave to take back control on the 23rd of June 2016. As the Electoral Commission subsequently found, uh, a series of legal offences were committed by Vote Leave during this referendum. These were mostly tied to campaign expenses and the use of social media and expenditure on social media. What the Electoral Commission did not have the power to find is that none of these claims were true. Um, it is untrue that taking back control would give millions uh, to the NHS. Indeed, it's almost certain that Brexit will now lead to privatisation and the sale of the national health system, primarily to US investors. Two, um, taking back control does not mean creating new jobs with new trade deals, as we'll deal in a couple of slides time. It, it will inevitably lead to trade costs and the loss, loss of jobs. Three, Taking back control does not mean greater control of the borders. The UK is not a member of Schengen like Denmark is, so it has closed borders, policed by border forces, by customs officials and by the border police themselves. Uh, the UK is introducing a point system which will discriminate against poorer employees, in particular key EU uh, workers that have kept uh, British people alive during the coronavirus crisis, in particular, healthcare workers and nurses and doctors, uh, care workers in social care, in elderly care, services such as hospitality services, catering, and the food industry, and agriculture, in particular, farm workers and workers in the field. All of these four areas of key workers will be excluded under the new point system with dramatic effects on British society. Fourthly, the claim that taking back control would lead to greater security was untrue. The European arrest warrant, which allows um, expedited, that is faster um, arrests and deportation of foreign criminals has led to 6,500 non-British European criminals being um, deported since 2010 that will end on the 1st of January 2021 with the full Brexit. 
And finally, our taxes. Let's take back control and cut VAT on household energy bills. A 5% tax or sales tax on known as VAT was introduced by the Conservative Party on energy bills in 1993 because John Major had crashed the economy in the ERM crisis and needed uh, some form of income and started to tax poorer and more vulnerable people through their energy bills. All of these things were untrue. Legal offences were committed, which is why we often describe the referendum itself as being illegal. It was an advisory referendum with illegal contact, with no convincing result, uh, with illegal conduct. Although of those that voted, 52%, approximately 52% voted leave and approximately 48% voted to remain within the EU, out of the electorate, these margins were much, much narrower, 35 to 38. And amongst the people who are resident in the UK, as the pie chart on the top left-hand corner shows, of those that were actually resident at the time in the UK, 27% voted to leave and 25% voted to remain. Very, very close and unconvincing result. But more importantly, almost half of the people in Britain didn't vote for either. Since that time, and particularly since June 2017 and the election of Theresa May, narrowly as Prime Minister of the UK, there has been a collapse in support for leaving the EU. When asked in a pu public opinion poll, do you think Britain was wrong or right to vote to leave the UK? Today, in, at the end of September 2020, the most recent um, poll states that about 56% of British people that expressed an opinion compared with 43% uh, want to remain within the UK. They've started to see what a disaster this means and they want to remain. But this has been ignored by the government itself. This has social consequences. The referendum campaign and life in Britain since the uh, referendum in 2016 has social consequences. And I'll just pick up on a couple of these. The first is that the, uh, one of the campaign groups behind the, uh, the vote to leave the EU was led by this individual. This is Nigel Farage, a far-right uh, populist political leader who'd spent his whole career in the European Parliament trying to leave the European Parliament. He led a party, um, a group in fact, of which he was the owner, called UKIP, and subsequently the Brexit Party, which engaged in racist campaigning, both online and offline. This breaking point poster from just prior to the referendum was probably the worst example of invoking a type of racism. And he was supported by far-right organizations, in particular online and on the streets of the UK and through social media uh, and systematic campaigns of lying, in particular on Facebook uh, and Twitter as well as, interestingly, Russian troll farms based in the Russian Federation, basically making up and dis, um, uh, propaganda and spreading dissent throughout the United Kingdom. One of the consequences of this racist campaign has been the explosion of hate crimes since 2016. If you look at the bottom left-hand diagram, um, this is a, a Home Office report from hate crime in England and Wales um, from 2012, 2013 to 2018, 2019. An epidemic of hate crime has spread across England and Wales. In particular, hate crime on grounds of race, religion, sexual orientation, disability, and transgender identity. Um, that's people of color, uh, people of different religions, um, uh, 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 people of different sexual orientations find themselves increasingly at the end of uh, hate crimes of, uh, and of assaults. And, and this type of um, problem uh, will not suddenly end on the 1st of January 2021. Indeed, it's reportedly getting worse. Let's switch to the economic aspect of Brexit opportunities and consequences. The premier argument for leaving the EU um, was about taking back control of borders, um, throwing out in particular foreigners and people of colour from the UK, and the economic advantages that free trade would bring to Britain after leaving the EU. 
The major argument was that the EU prevented the UK from engaging in free trade practices around the world. Um, this was, of course, not entirely true at all, because certain countries, and Germany was foremost amongst them, were far more successful than the UK in engaging in international trade. Indeed, Germany is one of the world's biggest uh, exporters of um, uh, goods and, to a lesser extent, services around the world. Um, I'm going to talk here about goods exports, uh, service exports and foreign direct investment. Uh, prior to 2016, certainly members of the Leave campaign seemed to have a, what I would describe as a globalised view of the world, that the world increasingly was trading faster and faster through ships, through containers, through Maersk facilitating the globalisation of world goods, and through the internet facilitating the globalisation of service use and service exports, whether that financial services or media services like Netflix and HBO and social media. To a certain extent, this was true in the period, let's say, 1990 to about 2007. But the global financial crisis of 2007 put a break, brought to an end, this explosion or globalisation of world trade. And since uh, the crisis of 2007-2008, international trade levels and the speed of international exchange has declined. Uh, one of the reasons for this is that international trade is always greater between countries that are closer together geographically and culturally. This is known as the gravity equation, that there is a gravity between countries that are closer to each other. Uh, and this finding, this empirical evidence, is based on thousands of um, pieces of data and hundreds of different uh, an analyses. analyses. Um, let me just read to you what a gravity model is then. The gravity equation in international trade is one of the most robust empirical findings in economics. Bilateral trade between two countries is always proportional to size, measured by gross domestic product, and inversely proportional to the geographical distance between them. Basically, bigger economies closer to each other trade more, smaller economies further away trade less. Um, and that's an important factor. These two diagrams illustrate this. The left-hand diagram one shows that trade in goods, that's physical material, is greatest between the UK and the rest of Europe, and always will be. There's no breaking the gravity model. The right-hand diagram, too, shows um, that this is also true for service exports. UK service exports, and the UK economy is a service economy, is greatest with those economies nearest to it, plus, to a certain extent, the United States. There's a third diagram, I've not shown it here, which is foreign direct investment. That's money flowing into an economy to invest in stocks and shares and ownership of uh, companies and corporations is also subject to the gravity equation. Economies nearer and bigger to you will always be more important than those further away, even after Brexit. So the gravity model the gravity equation in international trade means that free trade opportunities that were promised in the referendum are unlikely to be materialising any time soon, and certainly not in my lifetime. Even if an agreement is signed between the UK and the US and China and India and other economies around the world, they will never replace or surpass those with the rest of Europe, with the rest of the EU. There are some economic consequences of this uh, Brexit process. First of these, in the top left-hand corner, is the collapse in the value of the pound sterling. The pound is known as sterling on international money markets. Since uh, 2016 referendum, where the value of the pound was worth about $1.50, one and a half dollars, um, in the intervening four years, the value of the pound has collapsed to $1.25. That's a 20% uh, loss compared from now back to 2016. And that means the British economy is worth 20% less, that British 
um, holiday makers, that British companies, that British investors can have 20% le uh, less spending power. Interestingly, if we go back further to this date, the 2nd of October 2007, just as the global financial crisis was breaking out, the pound was equivalent to $2. So pound sterling is collapsing in value and we expect it to collapse further. That makes the British economy extremely vulnerable to take over by foreign investors purchasing basically bargain basement or giveaway companies, operations, um, even as we've seen football teams uh, and football stars. The second diagram to the right shows what happens if we extend the existing patterns uh, of value of future gross domestic product. How is the British economy going to do? This is a recent study, it came out last week, in, uh, produced by the, um, the London School of Economics. It predicts that over the next 15 years, the effects, economic effects of COVID will reduce the size of the British economy by about 2%. That's pretty bad. Um, in the second quarter of this year, the British GDP collapsed by about 22% in one three month period, a quarter. But if the, even if a free trade agreement is negotiated in the next two weeks, and it's due to be discussed at the European Council meeting on the 15th and 16th of October in Brussels, that would lead to almost a doubling compared to the COVID effects of a loss of about 3.7, that is 4% over 15 years. If an agreement is not reached, a no deal Brexit, in the next two weeks, that loss will be almost double again, about minus 5.7% GDP over 15 years. Any of these effects is disastrous for the British economy um, and will lead to a further weakening of sterling as well as other um, economic and social effects. The third uh, image, the bottom left-hand corner, sets out how COVID-19 has led to a steep economic downturn, but that Brexit risks causing far longer damage. And it demonstrates how these effects play out over the next 15 years. The diagram flattens over 15 years, not because that that's what is going to occur, but because they don't want to model beyond 15 years. There's a likelihood this may get better or it may equally get worse. The sum uh, effect of this is that a no deal Brexit will lead to a 3.3 trillion pound decline in GDP over the next 15 years. The British economy is worth about 2 trillion, about 2.2 trillion pounds. So that's more than the value of the current British economy will be lost in the next 15 years. This, of course, is a, a disaster. There are personal consequences of this. It's not all about international economics. It's not all about stocks and shares. Uh, two diagrams here illustrate these personal consequences. Um, the claimant count on people who are seeking unemployment benefit has exploded over the last six months. That's no surprise. Um, from January 2008 to January 2020, there has been an increase from about 3% unemployment in 2008 to today, where there's approximately about 9% unemployment. The, um, the scheme to support incomes is about to be withdrawn uh, sometime in the next month, which means we will see a further expansion of unemployment above 9% into double digits. We've not seen levels of unemployment in Britain that high since Margaret Thatcher basically collapsed the manufacturing industry of Britain in 1980, 1982 and 1983. This has serious personal consequences. Um, we're starting to see, for example, the manufacturing industry, in particular the car industry, and the closure of a Ford and a Honda plants um, start to affect ordinary working people in the United Kingdom. The right hand diagram illustrates what this means for the population as a whole. It is a diagram of gross domestic product, that's the economic activity of the economy as a whole, per capita, that is per person of the UK, in current prices from 1984 to 2024, the last 
um, few years are a projection. What it illustrates is that the average per, capa per capita gross domestic product of the UK peaked in about 2007 uh, and has gone up and down ever since. Um, the, this, the projection is that uh, without COVID and Brexit, we would expect the average GDP per capita to return to 2007 levels by about 2028. That is two decades of economic stagnation. But quite clearly, as we've seen from the previous slide, the effects of COVID-19 and the Brexit crisis, whether there is a free trade agreement or not this month, um, means that we would expect further declines from the 1st of January next year. This raises the likelihood that for the average person, when they, you convert GDP per capita into income, into life opportunities, for the average person, they are unlikely to see their income, their wealth increase um, for the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, that is a two, uh, two to three, perhaps longer decade period of decline in British economic history. This is unheard of. The last time we had declines on this level was prior to the Napoleonic Wars of 1805 to 1815. Um, and the long-term effects on British politics and British society and the British economy are potentially much, much more worrying than the immediate crises. The third story I want to talk about here is services. This has not been discussed widely because it's a little harder to uh, think about and to comprehend. The British economy, the UK economy, is a service economy, more so than any other economy in the world. When I talk about services, I talk about not tangible, not physical goods, not products, not cars, not phones, not computers, but intangible services, financial services, personal services, holiday, cultural, travel services, things that you can hold, but you can use or experience. The top left-hand diagram talks about how the UK relies heavily on service exports, more so than France, the USA, EU, and Germany. Denmark is a little similar to France and the USA in terms of being an export economy, but the UK is even more of a um, export economy. About 85% of British people working work in the service industries. About 80% of British economic activity, its gross domestic product, is in the service area. On, of that activity, services constitute about 46% of all British exports. They are the major component of the British economy, and they've not really yet been talked about, but they are the most vulnerable to Brexit and the consequences of Brexit. The second diagram in the bottom left-hand corner tells us where the UK's largest export markets for services are, are, are going, and it's the EU and the United States. Uh, together with Switzerland, which is part of the EU's um, uh, relationship to the uh, European free trade area. UK service exports primarily go to the e EU 40% and the US 23%. What does Brexit mean for the service economy of Britain? The top left-hand diagram shows that the UK's main service exports are businesses that is business to business services and financial services. The UK's main service exports are other business services. That's about a third of its economy and third of its exports. Accounting, advertising, architecture, legal, research, technical, professional services to business. All of these are covered and protected within the single market agreement on the freedom of movement of services. There's no other agreement, no trade agreement, no international or multinational trade agreement that has anywhere the level of protection for these non-tariff uh, barriers. That is behind the border activities which require regulation and competition policy. The bottom right hand diagram illustrates what's happening to the second most important area of financial uh, of services, that's financial services. In particular, financial service firms, banks, investment brokers, etc., are moving from London 
to Dublin, Luxembourg, Paris, Frankfurt and Amsterdam. A report came out. Um, Scottish independence is an extremely important question in this overall conversation. Um, it's not the only independence challenge though. So I want to talk about all four of the UK's so-called nations. The referendum results by country, the top left-hand diagram, give the results for England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Quite simply, Scotland, and to a lesser extent Northern Ireland, voted overwhelmingly to stay in the EU, to remain in the EU. Interestingly, the more Welsh-speaking parts of Wales also voted to remain in the EU. And so the EU vote has actually inflamed and exaggerated nationalist claims to independence, most importantly in Scotland, but interestingly in Northern Ireland, uh, in ways that very few people had imagined prior to the referendum. As I've mentioned before, there was a previous referendum, the first full independent Scottish referendum in 2014, which was lost by 45 in favour of independence to 55 in favour of, uh, of uh, remaining in the UK. <clears throat> Many people thought this would be the last time this would be discussed in this generation, that's in the, in the next 30 years. But a combination of the UK-EU referendum result and COVID has pushed the issue of Scottish independence back to the top of the political agenda in Scotland. If we take the right-hand survey, of, which tracks public opinion support for Scottish independence in Scotland, we can see how this had varied over time, up until about June 2017, the time that Theresa May became Prime Minister of the UK. Um, and there was a long period from 2017, June 2017, up until... Um, about June 2019, when opposition to Scottish independence was quite strong, very similar to the referendum results itself. But since January 2020, that is the last 10 months, support for Scottish independence has now increased and is increasing significantly and has remained positive, the first time this has happened before. So we now have a consistent majority of Scots who now support independence for Scotland. Partially because they voted to remain in the EU and uh, Boris Johnson against public opinion across the UK and in Scotland wants to and has decided to leave the EU. But secondly, because the COVID crisis has demonstrated how uh, Boris Johnson, the English Conservative Party and British government in London has relatively little interest in the health and well-being of Scottish people. And this has been held for the, by the Scottish Nationalist Party and Nicola Sturgeon as a very, very important aspect of gaining independence and keeping the focus on Scottish health and hot Scottish concerns. Diagram three in the bottom left hand corner shows how quickly that support for Scottish independence has now switched. The most recent survey says that the polls have switched completely. 55% of Scottish people polled now want independence and have done uh, for the last six to eight months. 45% uh, don't want independence. This of course has a regional effect. If you look at the bottom left hand map, um, the whole of Scotland is in 55-45, uh, but certain parts of Scotland, particularly the Highlands, the, the Scottish homelands in some respects, uh, very keen on independence. Um, Edinburgh, very keen on independence. Glasgow, uh, incredibly strong on independence. And then uh, the, the, the borders with England uh, still support membership of the United Kingdom. This issue is not going to go away now in this generation. Um, Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister of Scotland, has announced uh, her decision that she wants to pass law in Scotland for a second referendum. Um, probably sometime in the new year after Scotland leaves the e, uh, uh, the UK leaves the EU with all the border crises and um, tariff and customs problems that are coming, she will use that momentum to try and drive through a referendum. But it needs consent of the UK and of Boris Johnson for it to become legally binding. Scotland 
isn't the only factor here, though. The other nations or countries of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland also have nationality issues. Possibly more important in terms of um, not economic, but uh, in terms of questions of security and conflict is uh, Northern Ireland. Um, in Northern Ireland, as you'll be familiar, from the 1970s to the 1990s was a, uh, a guerrilla war of independence uh, waged by, in particular, the Irish Republican Army, which involved bombing campaigns in Ireland and in the United Kingdom, uh, killing an, uh, many uh, innocent civilians and blowing up the city of London and the shopping area of Manchester. Um, since 1998 and the Good Friday Agreement, there has been peace between the nationalist, um, that is the, uh, the, uh, the Southern Irish uh, perspective and the Unionists, that's the UK perspective. Um, but both sides now expect, if not today, then sometime in the next 10 years, there to be greater support for rejoining or joining the Republic of Ireland. Today, about 51% of Northern Irish people would like to join the Republic of Ireland, but this will inevitably involve, I suspect, violence and further bombing campaigns. In the next 10 years, uh, I would expect that number to increase by possibly five, perhaps 10%. So this issue is not going away, and in a 10 years' time, we could be looking at it again, but it will be extremely controversial and no doubt bloody. The third nationality question, less important, but still hovering in the background, is Welsh nationality. As the picture in the bottom left-hand corner shows, the referendum results in Wales by local authority gave support for uh, leave in uh, mid Wales and South West Wales, but support for Remain in West Wales, which is the Welsh-speaking heartland of Wales, and interestingly, Southeast Wales, in particular around Cardiff and the borders with the UK, which is the labour controlled areas of Wales. Uh, a recent poll in Wales suggested that more than 50% of late Welsh labour supporters now supported independence. In the past, independence support has been very, very low 20, and now the most recent uh, polls, about 25% people want immediate independence. But if you add together those, that want immediate or were those would like stronger powers for the Welsh National Assembly, the Senate in, uh, in Cardiff, those go as high as 32%. Again, like the Nor Northern Irish question, this has been exaggerated and brought to the top of the political agenda in Wales by the referendum result, by the Brexit decision by uh, the Prime Minister, and by the effects of COVID, where Wales introduced greater controls on people leaving England and entering Wales to prevent infections in Wales. Saying anything about the UK and the USA is very difficult because the election <coughs> next month on the uh, 3rd of November <coughs> could potentially change much of this. But just to surmise, uh, Joe Biden, that's the Democrat candidate, um, former vice president under Barack Obama, tends to have a preference for um, the benefit of the US and the US market, in particular working people in the US. He wants to work with the EU and had, in this most recent tweet from September the 16th, um, will not uh, agree any trade agreement with the UK if the UK, as it is currently doing in Parliament, breaks the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 that brought peace to Northern Ireland as a casualty of Brexit. So. That's really bad news for Boris Johnson, the British government, if Joe Biden becomes prime minister. And, um, but in some respects, it's good news for ordinary British people. In contrast, Donald Trump, as he tweeted last year, <clears throat> wants to do a really great deal, a massive new trade deal after Brexit with Boris Johnson. Um, this deal has the potential to be far bigger and more lucrative than any deal that could be done with the EU. Let's celebrate Boris. But his preferences are in particular for wealthy individuals, wealthy groups within the US, his base in some respects, to intervene and regulate UK market access, potentially as a tool to undermine uh, the EU. Here are some aspects of the current 
EU, uh, UK, US trade negotiations. One, and this is what Trump wants. He wants health standards in the UK to be reduced, um, in particular protections on consumer products and food to be reduced uh, so that cheaper, potentially more dangerous US foodstuffs can enter the British economy. He wants to override the precautionary principle in the environment, that is to weaken environmental protections in the UK as he's done in the US, in particular through climate change denial. He wants uh, something called ISDS, which is Investor State Dispute Settlement, to be in favour of corporates. So if the British government subsequently does something which restricts the power of American corporations, the British government can be fined and taken to court and lose by American companies. Four, he wants public services in the UK to be open to purchasing and being taken over by US companies, in particular the National Health Service, education, schools, universities, transport, transport infrastructure, including rail, rail services and prison services. He wants to all be available for US corporations to purchase and run um, at a profit. He wants regulatory competition to be ruled upon by tribunals between uh, US officials and UK officials, not by the Parliament of the UK or by uh, the Houses of Congress. He has insisted on secrecy in trade negotiations, which is why this is a difficult topic to work out what's going on, and that all trade agreements uh, not be subject to UK approval. The current bill, called the Internal Market Bill, being put through Parliament at the moment, which is what you'll read about in the news everywhere, by Boris Johnson, takes away the right of Parliament to debate and have a say in trade negotiations, i.e. it renders it undemocratic and at the same time gives Britain the right to withdraw, and by Britain I mean Boris Johnson and uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, the, the right to withdraw from any previously negotiated international agreements without the consent of Parliament. And so this is why there's such a, an outrage about Britain being uh, presented as, in effect, a rogue state, um, which undermines, of course, the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, penultimately, the US trade deal will restrict UK sovereignty in that the uh, Parliament will be lose the power to rule and regulate over the UK economy and its independence. In effect, the UK will have to do what the US says um, in trade and in foreign policy. In this respect, the US is what we call the global trade hegemon, the greatest power on the planet, and will use its power to drive the UK's foreign policy, in particular insisting that it recognises um, US uh, supporters around the world, including, of course, Russia and uh, Israel, uh, and use UK foreign policy to undermine its relationship with the EU. What does the future hold for post-Brexit Britain? This is very, very difficult to say. Um, I've got two slides. One is what's going to happen next year on the 1st of January 2021. And two is what's going to happen for the rest of my and your lives. One, Britain has a food crisis on its hands. Um, Britain has not fed itself from produce produced in Britain since the Napoleonic Wars, as I mentioned, of the early 19th century, uh, 1805 to 1815. Even during the Second World War, it relied on assistance from the Dominions, the rest of the empire, and from the United States in food convoys to keep people alive. Um, any one of my parents' generation will tell you how close the Second World War was in terms of starvation for the United Kingdom. About 50%, 53% of food originates in the United Kingdom, top left-hand diagram. Um, but this is estimated to fall by about 20% over the next uh, 50 to 60 years, depending on the climate emergency. Even though it produces foodstuffs in the UK, much of this is exported, particularly livestock, that's animals, are exported to the rest of Europe and the EU. In particular, fishing. One of the, the debates in the free trade agreement at the moment that's being try, negotiated with the EU is not just free trade, but fishing and uh, competition rules. Um, much of the UK catch is exported to the rest of Europe. And no, you can't keep it in a lorry for very long if you're waiting on a motorway. The second diagram shows 
that food imported to the UK is essential for keeping British people fed. About 80% of UK supermarket food, and in general about 80% of food across the UK, comes from the rest of the EU. Some uh, additional amount comes via bilateral agreements um, which uh, have been negotiated with the EU being in charge. In particular, about 21% of fresh fruit and vegetables <coughs> comes from the EU and about 15% of meat and fish. Uh, is exported, uh, in, imported to the UK. On the 1st of January, even with a free trade agreement, there will be border controls introduced to all British ports and airports. We have not had broad, uh, border controls between the United Kingdom and the EU since um, the UK joined in 1973. 1972, 1973, the removal of border controls. So this is new. Um, a sudden realization that this will cause a tailback as each truck goes through the port of border, uh, Dover to Calais through the Eurotunnel, will slow down the procedure of inspecting customs documentation in both directions. It is anticipated on the 1st of January, 2021, um, that this will be about 7,000 lorries long queue. So this will push it through the, the nearest county, which is Kent, into the, the next counties. That's uh, Sussex, probably into Surrey, across the bridge into Essex. Um, any fresh produce, that's fresh fruit and vegetables, fresh uh, live exports, fresh fish, undoubtedly um, will decay in any such queue in both directions, leading to a food crisis in the UK. There's really no way out of this now. Um, the UK should have planned on this over the past four years. They didn't, um, because quite frankly, the British government is not competent. The longer story has three ways to it. I'll finish on this slide. This is a, a cartoon. Um, from one of the British newspapers saying, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. So said Boris Johnson, as COVID washed over the Palace of Westminster, the, uh, the British Parliament, the House of Commons. The point one, COVID-19, the UK response has been the worst in Europe. There have been until the September the 11th, the most recent data, approximately 67 excess deaths compared to previous years. That's the worst death rate um, in Europe and the EU. This is largely due to government incompetence. Um, there is a lesser factor of high population density in the UK and behavioural issues amongst the uh, UK population. The second wave has begun in September and it's probably twice as deadly as the first. The uh, rate of infection in the UK is doubling every seven days and it's up to 7,000 people I think infected uh, yesterday. We would expect um, a higher death rate than the first wave then to wash over Britain this winter, including after the 1st of January 2021. Brexit isn't just a shock to the UK's relationship to the EU. It is a structural crisis. The free trade agreement, if it's agreed on the 15th and 16th of October, will just be the start of that structural crisis. Um, the UK chose not to have a customs union. It chose not to join the European economic area. Um, it chose to negotiate a, um, a free trade agreement, which is the weakest form of trade agreement between the UK and the EU. If it trade, had agreed a customs union, it wouldn't have the border controls, but there's no, now no way back from that. The customs and food crisis of the 1st of January is just the beginning of this problem. Uh, it will swiftly be followed by an agricultural and manufacturing crisis because of the systems of just-in-time production and uh, supply networks which affect British agriculture and the British manufacturing industry, in particular cars and the aviation industry, to a lesser extent pharmaceuticals. But the real challenge, as I've talked about in this talk, is the service sector crisis. And that will play out over a long, much longer period of time as disinvestment and um, highly skilled service sector employees leave the sector and leave the country. But the biggest challenge, the biggest wave, is the third wave. There is a climate emergency across the planet and the UK and particularly the Eastern UK is one of the most vulnerable parts 
of Britain and Europe to sea level rise and storms. It should be said the other two vulnerable countries uh, in particular are the Netherlands, which as you know is almost entirely flat, and Denmark, which is largely flat. The map to the right shows the effects of sea level rise and uh, storm, annual storm events in Britain. The red areas are those areas that will be flooded or regularly flooded. Weather extremes will also affect agriculture, which of course ties this to the agriculture and manufacturing and food crisis. Uh, weather extremes will shift the way in which Britain is able to feed itself, both on livestock, that's live animals, and in terms of cereals and crops and vegetables. The globalised, liberalised economy that the British government hopes to um, uh, use and uh, take advantage of with free trade negatively affects the environment. 